You are watching With a Cup of Tea, the High Plains Book Awards edition, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings, Montana. Now here's our show. Welcome to This House of Books. I have with us today Jory Mickelson, uh, finalist uh, for the uh, High Plains Book Fest, and he has a, a terrific book of poetry, uh, Wilderness Kingdom, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but maybe first we'll talk about you, Jory. Go ahead and tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Jory Mickelson. Uh, I was born in Dillon, Montana, where my parents were attending Western Montana College at the time. And after they graduated, they settled in Stevensville, Montana, where I am speaking to you from today at their house. Well, tell us about the book. You know, really, it's a, a collection um, that, that's sort of a coming of age or a reckoning with the landscape, um, you know, internal and external. And so a lot of those poems um, deal directly with um, family history or anecdotes from other people. And they're all tied into the landscape from the High Line to the mines in Butte to the Rocky Mountains, um, even, even a little bit over to the coast. But, you know, by and large, um, the, the landscape that I grew up in and that my family grew up in, you know, my, my great grandmother was a, a High Line dry land wheat farmer who was homesteader. And uh, one of my other grandfathers did work in the mines in Butte. And both of my parents are from Anaconda. So, you know, I, I really have a a wide uh, family history within Montana, I think fourth or fifth generation now. And so sort of um, that landscapes embedded in me through story and through have living, you know, being raised in it. And so that is sort of translated into the book. And it's about um, what does it mean to be from a place and what does it mean to sort of struggle against it and define yourself against the landscape? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm gathering there's uh, quite a bit of it that features uh, uh, really uh, spiritual practice, a, a real strong interest in uh, um, a spiritual connection to nature. I would say, I would say absolutely. As much as, much as, as can be received in the Western tradition, you know, I was um, raised um, out of doors, fishing and hiking and camping. Um, I was pretty involved. I mean, I, I grew up in Stevensville and I love the place, but there's not a lot happening here. So I was involved with scouting from a very young age. Um, so, you know, I was, I was immersed in this landscape, especially in the Lee Metcalf Wildlife Refuge and places like Kootenai Creek um, or St. Mary's, um, you know, the mountain. So there were a lot of opportunities to like get into nature and, Honestly, um, my ties to the land were probably stronger than the ties to the religious faith I was raised with. Um, you know, because I was always around the land. I was always looking at the sky, at the birds. I was always wondering what the name of something was that I hadn't seen before. Because um, there's always something new. And I often, as a child, I did not feel that, that there was always something new on a Sunday morning. Uh, you know, I was even walking in the refuge last night. And there was a pair of sandhill cranes about ready to take off. And... And I got to see them and, and their flights. And, you know, um, that against the sunset was a, re was a really moving thing. And uh, the natural world, no matter where I'm at, continues to, to inform me about place, but also about the importance and the values that I carry with me today. So um, it's, it's spiritual. You know, part of it is trying to define myself against the landscape, too, as a as a a queer writer um, raised in rural Montana, that's been incredibly challenging at different points in my life to sort of um, come out, be authentically myself um, and sort of, you know, what does, you know, what does that mean in a politically conservative or a religiously conservative environment? Like, how do I define myself against that? How do I keep considering myself a part of this, this broad cloth or, or this natural world or, you know, my hometown, um, in spite of any perceived differences. And really, you know, some of the book also struggles with that and sort of that reckoning of who I am as that person, where I am in this place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's curious to me um, how many um, 
LGBTQAI individuals um, who are writers we have in Montana. There, there are quite a few, and and many are excellent. So uh, you are definitely not alone in that. Yeah, uh, it's been um, a broadening of the Western canon in the in the re the past ten years, especially, have been really. Um, amazing to see a lot of new voices come forth from the West that maybe traditionally haven't been recognized or covered. I'm thinking of um, even the miseducation of Cameron Post. Um, yes. That was an excellent book. Um, yes. The, you know, and it was option for film. And I'm even thinking about other writers like Jake Skeets, who comes from the Diné or the Navajo tradition in the Southwest. He's a, he's a queer Diné writer, and he is fully writing within his tradition. Um, as an indigenous person and as a queer person and within Navajo culture and within the wider culture. And so, um, you know, Tommy Orange from Canada, I believe, you know, there's, there's all these, his book there, there, there's this, you know, there's this great expansion of what we used to consider the West, you know? And so it's more, much more of this tapestry that's grown in scope of what the West can mean and, and how that informs of, of what it could mean in the future. You know, that it's not necessarily just one story, but a collection of stories moving forward. Well, for a lot of, a lot of uh, people I know, you know, growing up queer in Montana was, you know, very, it was very hard. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people, I think, were, were pretty damaged by some of the things they experienced. And I'm wondering, um, where did you find your resilience? I mean, you seem to have, uh, you know, become a, you know, a, functional adult or <laughs> my parents are here to like contradict anything but um you know i i think the nap this is going to sound a little strange maybe but um you know part of my resiliency comes from the landscape itself um because we around other people there was that damage or, you know, a lot of the negativity that I experienced. But in the natural world, it was just like it was me and nature and I was free to be myself or to try on whatever identity seemed to suit me. And there was no one judging me back because everything in nature is just as it is in nature. Um, you know, out on the coast, uh, a friend was texting me and said, you know, oh, my gosh, a mountain lion just chased this yearling deer through my yard. Who do I call? And, you know, part of me is like, um, that's really exciting to see a mountain lion in your backyard, maybe a little bit scared. That would scare me. Um, you know, but on the other hand, there's no one to call because that's nature. If nature is just being nature as much as it might shock us. And so, um, you know, the wilderness or, or that, that space of the wild really just held me and let me be how I was without judgment. So some of my resiliency comes from that. I think in Montana, um, LGBTQ individuals who have stayed um, and stayed strong across the age spectrum have really helped. And so, you know, I came out in the mid to late 90s and Montana was still trying to um, get the sodomy laws off the books as a felony. And so that, that whole movement was happening as I was coming out. And it was a much different face um, to what I would experience today in Montana. And so the individuals who were fighting those fights and who were older than me um, mentored me in a lot of ways that um, I, I continue to be grateful for. And I continue to, as, a, as someone who's privileged to, you know, be out because I know that's not an option for everyone for personal safety, um, you know, for their own well-being, wherever they might be um, in Montana or out of Montana, that with someone who has that privilege and um, that sense of safety or the ability to speak out, that I really owe a debt to the people who came before me to sort of pay that forward and, you know, say, you're not alone, you're okay, and there's ways to live your life despite what other people might think of. There you go. Well, I, let me ask, who do you think would uh, be the target audience for this book? Sure. Um, hopefully uh, more than my parents. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and they say I'm a writer and they're like, oh, you're a writer. What do you write? And I said, well, good for me. It's poetry. Bad for you. It's poetry. Um, you know, 
poetry doesn't have this, I mean, we continue to use it at like weddings and funerals and important occasions, but often poetry doesn't seem to like make it into the wider culture. Although I would argue right now with the way the world is, it seems that the U.S. is having sort of this embracing of poetry again, which is really exciting. Um, but I would hope that there would be something in my collection for anyone who has ever appreciated the natural world. Um, you don't have to be a lover of poetry to get something out of it. Uh, one of my friends who uh, has a PhD in, in biology was saying, you know, um, I really appreciate the fact that you're the naturalistic elements in your poems are accurate. So, you know, and he, he's not, he's like, I don't really like poetry, but I really like the elements of the natural world in there are spot on. So I appreciate your attention to detail there. Um, you know, and you know, it to there's a lot of different voices. Um, often in poetry, unlike fiction, people just assume that the person who's speaking in the poem is the author of the poem. And that's not the case. There's, multiple voices or multiple people speaking from these poems. So um, I wouldn't want anyone just to think that um, Jory Mickelson is the one who's speaking from all these poems. So there's, you know, um, voices from the past, uh, voices other imagined other than myself, um, voices possibly from the future going forward speaking. So it's not just... Um, you know, a queer male person speaking in these poems um, from the present tense at, at all the poems. So I would hope that there's an audience beyond um, perceived identity or, or expectation of the author, um, whether, you know, you're heterosexual or LGBTQ, um, that, that there's, there's a broad appeal for the poems. Um, and I think definitely people who have been to the region and people who appreciate this area, Montana, the High Plains, that there's definitely something there for them. Um, you know, whenever I give a reading and there's someone who has spent a, a portion of time in the Montana and the High Plains come to me after a reading and they're like, I so appreciated that. It took me right to, you know, wherever the poem was set. You know, I could, I could picture it because I had been there. And th that's some of the strongest feedback that I've gotten from my work is that people who love this place and who are either from here or have passed through here um, continue to love this place and come back into contact with it through the work. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Jory. Yeah. I, I really appreciate uh, the interview and uh, I, I wish you great luck. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. So long. Bye. This program has been produced by This House of Books in collaboration with the High Plains Book Awards. The Book Awards were established to recognize regional authors and literary work that examines life on the High Plains. Nominations will be accepted starting in January 2021 on the website highplainsbookawards.org.